Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Welcome to the first ever BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando Murrin and today Tom and I are joined by food writer Rosie Burkett and we are talking about roasts. Oh, I've mentioned that word and I can almost f- smell the aromas drifting in from the oven. Tom, roasts, where do you stand on a Sunday roast? Aren't they like the best thing ever? <laughs> I mean, yes. is, is there anything better than that? And everybody's mum does the best roast. Like, you'll no, all no, say, no, my mum does. Nah, mate, it's not. <laughs> no, it's my mum. Like, that's, the, that's the argument. It's yeah. one of those things that as childhood memories, they're the big thing. That is the family meal that you sit down with because, you know, everyone has busy lives. Everyone, like midweek, not many people get to sit down as a family. So much is going on. But actually on a Sunday, there is a time where people have got time to cook and you remember as a kid that you know you sit there and you have Sunday lunch and it's amazing roasts are just the best it's the occasion as well as the food isn't it but, oh, yeah, but then there is the food and there is something about the fact that it's cooking for an hour or two and filling the house with delicious aromas and someone's in the kitchen making making all the bits to go with it. It's just a very good, comforting feeling, isn't it? I actually think that roasts are the reason that I'm sitting here right now. How so, Rosie? <laughs> because <laughs> my... I, we we will argue about this, but my mum does make the best roast, just to clarify. Um, and every every Sunday, so every single Sunday through childhood, we had them. And um, my dad worked in London during the week, so we didn't see him very much. And then on a Sunday, we'd all get together and have these roasts. And it, without fail, every single Sunday, even in the hottest, hottest heat waves. And they were such a huge formative part of my childhood and helping mum in the kitchen. I was her sous chef. I really wanted to be there. I wanted to know exactly what she was doing. She wouldn't, she's a control freak in the kitchen. So I was limited to very menial tasks, but I definitely couldn't get enough of watching and seeing what was going on. And the whole ceremony of it and the sitting with all the family and spending time together, it really, it really was the thing that got me into food. We're going to talk about gravy a bit later on because gravy is a very exciting subject and we've had lots of Instagrammers telling us that they want our gravy tips. But my mum used to let me make the gravy, so I think that's how I started cooking. Um, And she had a rather rickety little roasting pan, all bent on the bottom, which went on the hob, and then a a kind of weird flat whisk thing that you went round with. And it was very important. I should think I made terrible gravy. but So my mum, speaking of gravy, my mum has... um, basically the same gravy that she made in 1984 she's still using so a bit like how you use like sourdough starter to make every loaf of bread my mum keeps a bit of gravy from every roast and it's in like a flora tub in the freezer and she's got all these tupperware tubs in the freezer (laughs) labeled with the different gravies and she's got a little bit from each one and they just go on forever and she won't give me any she's like no i need that and it's like the never-ending gravy story it's a sort of glass de viande gone mad isn't it it's a distillation of all those wonderful roasts over the years yeah i wonder what a scientist would make of that i wonder they 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 probably close the house down i've got to be honest it might need to get you might be like that scene from et you know when they just like (laughs) it it might it, it might be like that (laughs) I mean, gravy from 1984. I'm not sold on that, mate. I promise you, it just gets better and better. Um, Roasting feels very British. Uh, is uh, do other nations do it, Tom, or is it is it something that we we excel at? Unlike a lot of things, because we're we're always the laughing stock of the culinary world. Well, the French call us the roast, roast beef, beef, don't they? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. like it is something that we do, and we do incredibly well. And we have got uh, the the idea of roasting meats, and we're very good at doing roast beef. You know, it, it's in particular, it's something that we're well known for doing. And it, it, you know, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding is famous the world over. It's like fish and chips, and yeah. it is. It's it's, it's we. Our beef is some of the best in the world, if not the best in the world. And and then roasting it properly and serving it with a Yorkshire pudding, which is delicious, and then making the right gravy with it. And it, it is one of those dishes that's iconic. And because it, it's 
it's quite simple to do and the veg garnishes are quite sim it's all everything about it is about the produce and it, it allowing it to sing for itself it isn't a necessarily an over complicated dish but yeah other nations do do it very well the french do i mean i would look at the french the way that they slow cook lamb the way that they roast like a shoulder of lamb on top of boulanger potatoes mm. and they roast that beautifully and that's a single dish on its own that's cooked for five or six hours on a low temperature they do it slightly differently but yeah other nations do roast meats. They do the delicious rotisserie chickens as well, don't yeah, they? The French. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, so, absolutely so good. incredible. Yeah, but the the plain roast just slapped into the oven with a bit of good dripping is, is curiously... It feels very British because it's plain and simple and honest, isn't it? Yeah, but and it does the same happen with the vegetables, the re really. Yeah, but it, it, it does happen in in every other. If you think of some of the most fantastic Greek cooking, is very simple dishes that are just chucked in the oven with some dry herbs over the top and seasoned and roasted, and then the vegetables that are served with it are the vegetables that are native to that country. The things that work really well, whether it's aubergines and courgettes or tomatoes or whatever else, depending on where you are. In this country, our roast is good because we go. Well, Right, as roast potatoes, carrots, turnips, parsnips, because essentially, I mean, we're a Northern European country. It's cold that most nine months of the year we have to wear a jumper. Yeah. We're pretty good at root vegetables. So, so you yeah. go, yeah, that's why it suits us and that's what we do. And it is something that is inherently British. You Look, wouldn't expect to go to Greece in the, in the middle of August and have roast beef of Yorkshire pudding and carrots, would you? But you would go and have a slow, slow cooked lamb covered in beautiful dried oregano and served with some amazing, beautiful uh, Greek salad on the side. It's still a roast. It's just native of that area. Yeah, like the Italians with their porchetta. Yeah. So yeah, they, yeah. you know, they'll butcher a pig and then they'll use that part of the pig, which is the the loin and the belly. Yeah, that's wrapped and ro rolled. Rolled with fennel seeds and oregano and chili and delicious. And then slow, slow, slow roasted, probably in a wood oven. And I think that what other countries tend to do, um, say perhaps in Spain, they do a lot of roasting over fire, don't they? And roasting in wood ovens and using kind of direct heat from charcoal or, or burning logs and roasting like whole suckling pigs. Which will add their, add their own distinctive flavour to, to the the thing to yeah. the meat but the it's got a kind of good rhythm to it uh, a roast meal because you you put it in the oven and then you get this it's not an intermission but you get an hour or something to do the accompaniments which is really well organized it's very practical isn't you it do, you get it works for time. everyone doesn't yeah, it yeah it's great i mean it is fantastic i mean we talk about it as childhood memories i remember my sunday lunches so i mean i grew up as a single parent family my mum there wasn't much money and it's something i've talked about before but we used to have so we couldn't have my mum didn't have enough cash to buy chickens or joints of meat or she used to roast kind of like a sausage meat roll you used to be able to buy like sausage meat and like a kilo wrapper and she'd get that and she would roast that as the joint but she would do everything else the roast potatoes the carrots the broccoli the peas the cauliflower cheese the whatever else that goes with it she would cook all of the accompaniment so I, we as kids never saw this as being the roast actually being there wasn't anything about not having any money or this being a cheap thing it was still there's a, a thing that's been roasted in the middle of the table and we've got all the veg and so it was always this it was an, a, a great day of excitement I mean, Sunday mornings I remember we would always go off to rugby uh, rugby training or, 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 or a game on the Sunday morning and come back and walk into the house and the smell of a roast dinner mm. is just it's amazing the smell of it is so wonderful isn't yeah, it yeah there's nothing better than on a cold winter's day walking into the house after something that's been cooking in the oven for so long and you're just overwhelmingly like I am hungry now. Yeah, like the, the window's all steamed up. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, so good. We've got a great recipe coming up, a Tom Kerridge recipe on the Good Food website for a pot roast chicken. Um, but before we do that, we've got lots of other things to talk about. But let's start off with pork. Yeah. Um, do you have a favourite cut of pork for roasting, Tom? I, I mean, I have to be honest, like pork is just like the dream. It's amazing. Who doesn't like crackling? I mean, it's just <laughs> fantastic. So, oh, social media's gone berserk about crackling. Yeah. They all want to know about oh, crackling, crackling and they all love crackling. Pork, it's the best thing. I mean, the best way to do it. So pork loin for me is amazing. It's mm. beautiful, but it hasn't got that higher fat content. So if you want to get good crackling on it, you normally have to cook things for longer. But that what that means is that you, you, you will quite often end up with the pork loin being overcooked and dry. Because it can go a bit balsa woody, can't it? And a bit... a bit Exactly. So what I would do, dry. if you're going to do pork loin, I mean, I, for roasting, I would always go for a pork belly and do a slow mm. roast. And you can either brine it first 
or to get a great crackling, right, you buy the best port you can get, very similar to the chicken thing. You've got to buy amazing port that you can afford, port belly. And then you on a Saturday evening for your Sunday lunch, you take it out of the fridge, put it on a cake rack, you stick it in the sink, you boil the kettle. You pour boiling water all over the top of that's the, the skin belly. side the skin yeah. side is what it, it scored, does it, scored at that point no, no don't no. worry about the whole scoring thing it doesn't really? matter yeah you don't worry about it and just pour it all over the top and it scolds the top and dries the skin like it, it will it will kind of shrink a little bit like curve up just a little bit and changes color from that kind of like light translucent pink to being slightly whiter and harder from where it has just been scolded then pat it dry with kitchen towel and then leave it on that cake rack out uh, out overnight okay don't let it sort of out of reach of the dog right mm, yeah. <laughs> uh, on the side leave it out overnight so then when you come down in the morning it's dry okay it's room temperature and it's dried out okay not cling film or anything like that then you put it into a into the oven low temperature around about 150 160 and you cook it for around about three and a half hours mm. right? and you will see it begin to crisp and go lovely and crunchy and crispy okay and then you turn the oven up to about 220 for the last 45 minutes and watch it and you'll get this amazing incredible crackle and it it's goes about that brittle drying. it goes that brittle exactly thing. it goes like glass it's about drying it out that's yeah. what yeah. can you do that under the grill or it needs to be in the oven. You, it needs you, to be you, in the oven. If you grill it, get, grill it is too much of a direct temperature. That, so you're just going to burn it. Yeah, you're yeah. just toasting it then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to um, assist a Vietnamese chef called Yuan Lu, and she made the most incredible Vietnamese pork belly. And her trick is to, um, in, in a similar way to what Tom was saying, poach the belly first in a, in a pan with a little bit of um, bicarbonate of soda. And that did the same thing to the skin, dried it out. And you would poach it in that and then let it dry. And then again, you're getting this. And let it dry overnight again or, or, for, or for, for a few, few hours. hours. Yeah. yeah, but the bicarb does something to the to the skin that really dries it out and makes for this incredible shattering crackling. I've heard of people drying out ducks with um, hair dryers to do that, the Chinese thing with them. Have you ever resorted to a hair dryer in your kitchen, Rosie? I haven't, no. Um, although I have been on food styling shoots where I've used a, a heat gun to to puff the skin up on a on a roast turkey but that's a different story um but- i get it, yeah it's to say it's, it's, it's a nice way of doing it you dry it first and then that and that's i mean i'm just show, i'm just We're showing just a showing video this. is this of, on instagram this is on my instagram yes. feed yeah. and it is of crackling that's being cooked exactly the same way that I just talked about. And that it is, is amazing. like it oh. shatters and shatters it's crispy. Like but the pork belly is so soft and juicy. And that's why pork belly is amazing for slow roasting because yeah. it has that higher fat content. And it it's keeps juicy. It yeah. still stays yeah. nice and juicy. And it's, and that, it's the perfect balance. It's, it's And amazing. it's cheaper. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's a it, much more yeah, economical Yeah, they're going to catch on to this, the fact that it's cheap, aren't they? And put the price up of pork belly if we it's all want it. It's not as cheap it. as it was, but it, yeah. but it is still we a bit cheap. We should keep our voices down, really, shouldn't we, so that they don't know <laughs> don't to put up the anyone. price. Now, can we move on to lamb? Oh. Where, where, uh, What do you like to roast? Shoulder. Shoulder. Slow roast shoulder. I like to pierce it loads and loads and loads and put cloves of garlic inside, loads of holes of it, stick it in the oven. Again, this is another one. Slow ro- slow roasting and it, so that you can fork it. It's got to be on the bone as well. And so by the end of it, you can just basically flake it off and creating a little paste at the end with some salted anchovies and some uh, garlic and some chilli and just smearing it all over the top. It's amazing. It's a very continental way of cooking. Is that all yeah. you? You, you smear that smear is done after after it's over is yeah, it about 10 minutes before the end of right. cooking just give it a nice little coat of like salted anchovies and garlic and some because I poke some anchovies delicious. in sometimes along yeah, with the garlic same you do sort that. of thing they dissolve it's See, very odd they, they, it just goes beautifully lamb with anchovies and you don't but anchovy haters don't know they're there so no you, it's just savoury so don't, don't have flavor. to tell them that's it it's not fishy at all it's this wonderful salty savoury flavour that's fantastic it goes so well with it anchovies are so good with, with meat in general I think I've, my new thing is anchovy mayo, actually, which is smushing up uh, some really good, like, oil-preserved anchovies and then just stirring through some really good shop-bought mayo and having it on, like, poached eggs, having it on beef sandwich. You know, it's really delicious. Tasty. Amazing, yeah. La- but lamb is one, because it's got a high fat content, it, it, lamb is beautifully roasted, slow-cooked. I mean, yes, you could do racks of lamb, you could do... but. 
I quite like a leg, like a new season leg of lamb. Yeah, delicious. And and maybe sort of do a light cure overnight. So do a cure with um, salt and sugar, equal parts, rub it all over the lamb, maybe put some rosemary and some garlic in there and then leave it in the fridge and that will draw out some of the moisture, concentrate the flavour of the leg. Um, And then that's a quicker roast in a hot oven, really good in a kind of wood oven, that would be. For that slow roast, I think shoulder is definitely better because it's fattier. And sometimes with the, the leg can go a bit... Bit dry and fibrous, can't it? If it's slow roasting it, and it's See, not that's that the not that attractive, with roasting, particularly for for home cooks. But even you know me on a day off on a Sunday, the last thing I want to do is worrying about core temperatures of making sure that something's nice and medium or medium rare and taking out and resting time. It's actually just a case of sticking it in the oven and enjoying the day, and that's yeah. where lamb and pork does so well with that beef. It's a little bit different. Yeah. And where you cut a rack of lamb or even a leg, you still want a little bit pink, you know, or lamb rumps. You still need to be, you need to keep a conscious eye of what you're doing so that you can still have it nice and pink. Because those cuts, if they're overcooked, they are a little bit dry and not, they haven't got quite got the fat content. But yeah. So would you te- check that with a digital thermometer if you need to? Yeah, digital thermometer is probably, is it's always the only the way best. without, otherwise you've got to cut into it to see what, what's going on in the middle, haven't you? I you're, mean, where you can use a cake skewer you can use the point of a knife and then put it out and then you you test it on the bottom of your lip and if it's just above blood temperature take it out then and leave it to rest oh that's a really good tip oh uh, i think that would require more confidence than i've got i wouldn't i wouldn't dare do that i mean i would what i wouldn't know is it about blood temperature i don't know what temperature my blood temperature is well (laughs) well, you know if it's if it's colder if it feels cold on your on your on the bottom of your lip or if it feels i mean if it's 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 a lot hotter than your lip then basically your lamb's overcooked (laughs) but it is a case of it is a case of just so you put the skewer into the centre of the meat and then you try it on your bottom on on the the edge of your your lip lip. yeah and and if if it's just above blood temperature then you take it out but you've got the resting process is so important that residual heat of like but when you're cooking things that you want to be nice and pink, you've got to cook them in a high oven, mm. not a low oven. You need high heat that kind of attacks that joint straight away and starts cooking. It gives it lovely roasted flavour on the outside right. and then really attacks yeah. it. And then when you can take it out, then that residual heat continues to permeate right through to the middle. Because if you've done it on too low a heat, it's not hot enough to continue cooking and it'll still stay cold in the middle. This is what I mean about the confidence of it. This is why pork belly, pork belly, pork lamb shoulder, yeah. job done, yeah. no worries. But it's always better to earn on the side of under when you're doing like you say when you're doing a a, a a roast in a hot oven because you can't go back once you've overcooked it whereas you, whereas it will cook on when you rest it yeah if you rest it for long enough as long as it's been hot to the core initially and you've got that temperature going through it take it out rest it whereas if you've overcooked it there's no going back Something I've, I've always wondered is if you're slow roasting something like the pork belly, is the resting time as important as if you're roasting it to pink in the middle? No, not as is important, but it's still good to rest it because it just relaxes everything. It just becomes, a, it's just easier to work with. It's, flavor-wise, it's, it's settled a bit more. It's not as hot. Everything's just relaxed. The fibrous uh, muscle content of the piece, of the joint of meat has just become a little bit more... Just everything about it. Resting is resting is good. And we're talking twenty minutes, really, for for a normal normal size at least join twenty to thirty. Yeah. Oh, even longer. Yeah. Of course, people are frightened of it going cold. Do, do we cover it with foil? We wouldn't cover, cover it with our... gravy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if it had crackling, you wouldn't want to cover Take it. Take it out with... the oven, turn the oven off, right? Yeah. Leave it for twenty minutes, half an hour, then put it back into the oven. That's the oven sat with that residual heat. By that time, it's gone from two hundred and twenty down to down to 50 or 60 and it will just sit there and stay warm we're consciously going everything should be hot well everything shouldn't no. be hot everything should be the temperature that it should be to taste the best yeah. which isn't hot it's actually around about 55 60 degrees centigrade which is just lovely that's where you want it to be do you remember what, in restaurants where you they used to bring out the plate and the plate was like white hot and they used to say don't t- don't go near the plate because it was so hot and they, people don't do that now nowadays and you don't go berserk with hot plates in your restaurants no the plates have got to be warm plates have got to be warm because otherwise the food goes cold but yeah you, you want the plate to be the right temperature you don't want it to be so hot that when you pour sauce on it it starts bubbling sizzling. and cooking it yeah, yeah. Or, you don't want to hear a sizzle or congealing it you yeah, don't want yeah, the opposite we're not, we're not either we're doing fajitas here served in it <laughs> But yeah, I think also when you're doing a, a roast to have hot plates is is good because as we say, if you have rested the meat and it maybe it's not, 
you know, it's not as hot as it could have been. Having it on a hot plate will, will bring that up again. And hot gravy, like you and said. Definitely, hot definitely hot gravy. Um, can we talk about beef then? Which joint of beef is your favourite to roast, Tom? Ribeye for me is, is my favourite. And that is one that you've got to look after. That's the one with the bone in it. Yeah. Uh, or, no, no, the, the eye. The, 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 right, so, right. so you can get you can get a full rib of beef, the same sort of thing where it's roasted joint with big ribs on it. You can get it on the bone or you can get the ribeye roll where it's taken off and just tied. But it has that beautiful kind of top cap of it. And then it's got a little eye of fat that runs through it and then kind of like the the eye of the meat as well which is absolutely delicious so as you slice it's like a ribeye steak but a whole joint of it and that's fantastic and because of the fat it's kind of self-basting in a sense yeah and beautiful flavor it tastes fantastic it's a great cut of meat but that is one that you've got to look after that is one that you don't want to overcook you gotta you gotta take your time and look after it so that's a proper special occasion concentration on the kitchen that's not drinking on the job that's not like (laughs) (laughs) disappearing and walking the dogs or your mind disappearing and watching the football right this is you are you're doing a proper job of cooking then you've spent a lot of money on a rib of beef you do not want to mess it up still to come on bbc good foods podcast with tom kerridge yeah is that what white white creamed it's a white sauce sauce, yeah made with onions yeah uh, lots and lots of onions but normal normal onions so you'd stew the onions in butter would you actually my mum used to do it in leeks as well it's fantastic yeah and then you're getting Ah. into cheesy leek territory which is a favorite yeah (laughs) see this is why roasts are amazing they they, they work with so many different things and those accompaniments are so special because they are it's upon layer upon layer upon layer of flavor and if the french laugh at us for having apples apple sauce with pork i mean Come on, that's a nation of people that eat horse and snails. Stop <laughs> stop laughing at our apple sauce, mate. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the accompaniments that we serve, the French laugh because they say that we always have jam with our meat because we do have these funny things like apple sauce and cranberry sauce and things like that. Uh, are you keen on the bits and pieces that go with? Yorkshire, Yorkshire pudding's been mentioned a few times. So I, I take it that we all adore Yorkshire pudding. Absolutely. I'm married to a Yorkshireman and my mum's I thought you were going to say I'm married so... to a Yorkshire pudding. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I, won't, I won't go that far. But yeah, um, I just think Yorkshire puddings, all the accompaniment, all the accompaniments for roasts are half the fun I I think it's like what Tom was saying earlier about your roast with with your mom when you're a child actually for me it's as much about the crispy bits and the potatoes and the cauliflower cheese and the Yorkshire puddings and the stuffing and the gravy than it is about the the meat itself or the or the nut roast and do you like Bread sauce? Yes. You bread sauce girl? I yeah. love bread sauce. It's delicious. It's wonderful stuff. But probably not other than at Christmas, really. Yeah, and I have it with the chicken, if I have a chicken. And I put the bread sauce underneath the chicken, which it, it instead of being this kind of thing that kind on of... On the plate. On the plate, underneath. Mm. So it's like an under sauce. And then you get the chicken and you get the gravy on top. Tom's looking very doubtful about that. No, it, I'm you're not, not going to see I that am, in the Tom restaurant. I am all over <laughs> all the accompaniments. Like bread sauce, onion sauce, cranberry sauce, a- apple, apple sauce. sauce. Apple sauce with the pork. Sauce, yeah. horseradish, Horse English radish. mustard. Give mint me sauce. all of them. Mint now, sauce mint with sauce is a bit of a killer, isn't no, that a bit sauce, too vinegary? No, I add more sugar to it. Or mint make sauce. a salsa verde. Mint, yeah, salsa well, verde. Well, that's not mint sauce, is it, Rosie? No, it kind of is. It's, <laughs> it's got mint green. in it and it's a sauce. Mint jelly. Mint you love jelly, a mint yes. jelly. On all of it. Give it. I'll have all of it on onion all of them. Sauce. Onion sauce. I heard sauce. you mention onion sauce. Yeah, with lamb. So underrated. Yeah, is that what white white creamed it's onion sauce? It's a white sauce. sauce, yeah, made with onions. Lots and lots of onions. Normal onions. So you'd stew the onions in butter would you yeah. my mum used to do it with leeks as well it was fantastic oh, leeks. Yeah. and then you're getting ah. into cheesy leek territory oh, no, well, which is that, a favourite yeah <laughs> see this is why roasts are amazing they, they, they work with so many different things and those accompaniments are so special because they are it's upon layer upon layer upon layer of flavour and if the French laugh at us for having apples apple sauce with pork I mean Come on, that's a nation of people that eat horse and snails. Stop, <laughs> stop laughing at our apple sauce, mate. <laughs> parsnips are something that I've never got on with. I had bad childhood experiences with parsnips, but everyone else seems to like parsnips. I love parsnips. They're delicious. <laughs> I do not like parsnips. They're amazing. <laughs> what was your bad experience? Yeah. Mm, well, actually, it dates back to Swede, I'm afraid. So anything in that Swede family I had problems with, they, they, we, we were kind of force-fed them at school and it was extremely nasty. It's so, always school. It, yeah, it, yeah. When people are fussy about food, I find 
most of the time you can track that back to school dinners. I was wounded by one particular school where my I thought you were going to say wounded by one particular parsnip. (laughs) Where the food was so disgusting that my mother couldn't believe the tales that we took home. And one day she turned up, my mother, at school during lunch and swept into the dining hall to see what we were eating. She did a Jamie Oliver. She did. And we were eating little bits, strips of flaky white overcooked fish with what we call piggy sauce which was this pink sauce on it oh. and she's and those mush, uh, mushy pea things and my what mother was the pink sauce it, 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 no one ever found out and my mother rose to her full height she wasn't very tall and said my children are not used to eating that sort of food and they won't be eating it anymore and my brother and I got exemption my darling mother wasn't that fantastic job she did there and so okay we went hungry but that was anything was better than fish in piggy sauce yeah. and Things better than that. Yeah. But that, I'm sorry, I've, I have digressed. But to return to the parsnips, I think you should explain how to do parsnips for those that do like them, even though I have said that I won't be enjoying them. Well, I tend to just parboil them very briefly, not for long at all, but just to take the edge off them. Um, and then into similar way as I do roast potatoes into hot fat. Um, I quite like to add later on when they've been roasting for a while, add a bit of honey, um, something do you pa- do you sweet. Can paint that on or just, just shake them around in a bit I'd probably just spoon some in and then toss them around yeah. in it and it would melt in the residual heat from the tray. Um, I quite like a pinch of cumin seeds on my parsnips. I think that works really, really, really well. Um, and one thing that I have been experimenting with um, that I love is to, when I've been poaching rhubarb and I have a bit of the rhubarb syrup left over, the pink, the bright pink, I don't know how you're going to feel about this, Tom, um, the bright pink rhubarb syrup, but that tossed on the parsnips is amazing because it gives that kind of sour, sweet, um, sherbety rhubarbness glaze to the, to the parsnips, which have got that amazing kind of earthy, peppery flavour. I mean, that sounds fantastic. I've got to be honest. I, I'm a big fan of parsnips. I think they're lovely. The only thing that I would do, I don't know quite how rosy cuts are parsnips, but I don't, I will serve them whole. I'll just peel them and roast them whole because they've got such a high sugar content in them and they break down. They're quite starchy. They break down quite quickly. It's not like a potato. They don't take as long to cook. So I like to roast them whole so that they, sometimes people cut them in half and take the cores out. But if, if unless they're not, if they're not that big, roast them, peel them and roast them whole and they're delicious. Uh, the rhubarb thing, I mean, actually, I, I can see where that's going. At I, we do a lot of things with rhubarb and rhubarb puree. It's an apple replacement. So where you have pork with apple sauce, we do a lot of it with rhubarb. Rhubarb and pork go so, so well together. So, so yeah, I, I'm up for rhubarb with roast. I mean, that, I like the idea of that with the parsnips, but I would do the, I would just do them whole and, and pretty much exactly the same as roses. You need quite small ones, though, don't you? Because sometimes you get a rhubarb and it's massive. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then you need to cut it into quarters. Yeah. But I like to keep the whole length of it because they look really nice, don't they? When they when you can see the kind of shape of the rhubarb. Probably not for you, Orlando. You've got bad memories. <laughs> we we had someone uh, on Instagram asking us, uh, having a pro- they've got a problem with the parsnips, is that they're not quite sure how to get them nice and soft without getting dry and crispy. Because they've got that point, the end does go a bit drier and crispier than the... the the thicker bit, doesn't it? So is that just the nature of a parsnip to be two things at once because it's got two ends? Yeah, you're going to end up with a crispier end and a softer... That's probably the pleasure. Yeah, you're going to end up with a crispy pointy bit and a softer back end. Yeah. (laughs) Just keep an eye on them and turn them. And do you aim for something green on the plate as well for your roasts? Rosie always. is Rosie always says Rosie. What what would you do then? Oh well, I. Well, it depends lo- what you've got on the allotment. It, does it? Well, it depends what's in season. Yeah, if it's um with a pork, I like a kind of um a nice brassica, so a, a, a lovely kale. We've got so much kale on the allotment at the moment, so a nice kale, maybe a cavallo nero, is really really nice with pork and with lamb actually. Um, or peas and broad beans. When peas and broad beans are in season, absolutely delicious with lamb and chicken. Um, and runner beans, kicking myself that I haven't planted any runner beans this year, but runner beans is such such a nice accompaniment with a roast. My mum used to have this, she's still got it, it's an implement. Have you seen this? It's a stringer, and it's kind of like a little square with um, metal prongs. And you, you pull the bean through it. You pull the yeah. bean through it, and it and the strings. Strings, and the strings and, go off at the side. And it yeah. turns them into these kind of spaghetti, yeah. and, then these, and then you blanch them, and then loads of butter, black pepper, salt. 
Really nice. And they smell so lovely, fresh runner beans, oh, don't they? So when they're delicious. being sliced, that lovely grassy smell that they have. Absolutely. I love them raw as well. Absolutely heaven. Oh, really? Like not on a roast, but when I'm preparing them just to crunch down on a raw. Now, we're going to talk gravy in just a moment, but I'm feeling a bit peckish. So <laughs> how would you feel like a little forkful of pot roast chicken? Tom Kerridge recipe for pot roast Love chicken. a pot roast. I love a pot. It's kind of like um, the idea of a pot roast is a play on a classic French dish like pot au feu. And it's that crossover between a roast and a casserole. So you kind of get everything in it. You get the roast bird. And the chicken works so well when you, you, when you pot roast it because it helps to steam it. And, and so it, it keeps it moister. It keeps the flavours a little bit more. It, it creates its own gravy. And it, it all gets very stock. tender, doesn't it? That, so exactly, every yeah. last morsel of chickiness, chickeniness, yeah. you can enjoy, can't I, you? Exactly that. Yeah. And also you haven't really got to worry about overcooking it because the thing about birds is the fact that you want the legs to be cooked properly so that, that you can take the meat off the bone quite nicely. But at the same point, when that happens, quite often the breast gets overcooked. But this way, because the breast is getting steamed or um, and poached, it, it's okay if it's overcooked a little bit because it's all about the flavour, getting everything together. Uh, Tom, we've got to stop talking now because we're going to take this lid off. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh, ah, wow. Golden, golden and steamy. Mm, it smells incredible. Herbs on the top. Lovely. And look at that skin. We like the skin of a chicken, don't oh, we? Just, I wouldn't have thought so you would tender. get a skin on... Um, it, it's fork tender, isn't yeah, that the it, expression? I just used a spoon to carve it. So that's always oh, a good sign. Oh, luscious. Absolutely luscious. Lovely. And you get all that lovely stock as well. Stock on and so you've got... You know, you might think that by pot roasting something, it, you get a rather pale kind of squishy result. But this is a gorgeous golden thing, isn't it? With lovely skin, yeah. lovely brown skin. But that's because it, it, you haven't got it all completely submerged in, in the stock. Yeah, so now it, I was going to ask you about this because the recipe specifies a particular amount of wine and water and it says uh, to pour that into the casserole but if you've got a different size casserole if you had a very small chicken shaped one it would cover it if you have a broader one it's not going to so are we aiming for a particular depth do you think you do, ideally yeah you want about an inch or two of the chicken sticking out over the top so what yeah. that, that happens that gets crispy and crunchy on the top but you also get it, it kind of steams it as well from the middle so it, it, it's always going to cook and it tastes fantastic so, but you do want to get a bit of texture but even if it covers it I wouldn't worry too much because you can always take the chicken skin off and you know it, it's it's all about the flavors that's in the pot but this to me looks for. perfect so that's what i want to do when i go home and i might not have the same size pot so i know how to recreate that exactly so about an inch or two that would be what three to six centimeters uh, poking out over the top and if you're doing braising of course it's a bit different because it's one third deep isn't it you take if you're braising something you do one third of the piece of meat depth so this is quite a lot of liquid this is quite a lot of liquid, but it creates its own stock. So you can then pass that off after you can use that to make soups. You can make that. You just use it for anything. You can use it for. And it's just, a double stock, isn't it? Because you use stock in there. So it's, it's chicken cooked in chicken stock. Mm. So you go, OK, so now you've got double chicken stock, which makes it even more amazing. Oh, Rosie, your mother would like that. She could put some of it in, in the freezer, yeah. couldn't she? And, <laughs> yeah, she's got she could keep this for another 30 years. <laughs> I'm sorry, I feel like I've done my mum a disservice. She really, <laughs> I think 84 was an exaggeration. But it does go on for a good few uh, roasts. This now, is so good. I, there's a lot of chomping sounds going on, which is a very good noise. But um, I do want to talk about gravy now because we all love gravy. Um, first, a quick question. Thick or thin? Thin. Thin, Tom? Mm, in well, the in the middle. I mean, not thin, but not claggy. Sunday night, there's pot roast. This is about it being stocky and loose and like a pot au feu. However, if you've done a roast chicken on its own or a beef, you want the gravy to actually be a little bit thicker so it coats, so you can you can dip things in it, so you can coat over a potato, so it, so it sits on the plate. So when you move it, you're not yeah. just slopping it all yeah. over yourself. So it I'm sits. not very fond of those clear gravies, which don't seem to be gravies at all, where, you know, it rolls around on the plate. No. 
I, I do tend to thicken gravies with a little how bit. Do you, how do you make your gravy? With, a, with, with flour. So, so do you do what my mother did? Get the roasting tin with yeah, the fat in it? Absolutely. So I'd roast the whatever I'm roasting. I'd roast it probably on maybe, it depends what's in season, but usually an onion, a carrot, a bit of celery, perhaps a bit of fennel, depending on what it is. I'd roast the joint on there. And then once I move the, the joint to rest, I'd get the tray, take the veg out, um, put the roasting tray over the heat, put a little, maybe if there was a lot of fat, like if it was something like a pork belly, I'd skim off some of the fat. Yeah. You don't want a greasy gravy, but yeah. you do need some fat to make the roux. So then I'd scatter um, flour into the tray. And then this is just how my mum made it and yeah. how, how I make it. And then just um, use the back of a spoon to to, so to cream, incorporate cream the yeah. flour into the fat and into the crusty bits that have formed where, from the caramelization they're of the really meat. They're really tasty. The crusty bits are really important, aren't they, and to then get I, them into it? Then I'd get some stock in there. Um, and again, having stock in the freezer is br- like this, for example, if you had this stock in from the freezer. 1984. From, from, from 1984. <laughs> you're halfway there, so the stock goes in, um, and then probably a slosh of something um, wine, or if it's poultry, I love a bit of sherry in there. Um, and then cook it until it's and keep tasting it, salt it, maybe a little bit of extra acid in the form of vinegar or lemon. But for me, it it needs to be thicker than, you know, than a liquid that hasn't been thickened, but it can't be too thick and like gloopy because that just, uh, to me, 100% is just the same. The only, the only thing that I would do different is I'd probably use a whisk rather than the back of a spoon just to make sure mm. that you're really beating out all of those lumps. And I'd pass it through a sieve at the end just to, just to, just to make sure that you've got all the lumps and bumps out of it. And then if you need to, you can just put a little knob of butter and whisk that in as well. Yeah. And then in terms of the alcohol thing, I'd always put that in pretty much last so that you get that that kick of like raw flavor that you get from alcohol. You're not looking necessarily for the taste of alcohol, but you're looking for what that a, a splash of red wine or a, a, a big slosh of sherry brings. It brings that a rawness of, of this flavor that enhances that taste. It brings it to life. So so exactly the same, the, the flour in the tray and, and a good stir in the pan and then add the stock. Cook Gives it out. a little bit of buzz, doesn't it? Just at the end. Definitely. Do you know, sometime, sometime we must talk about how to correct the flavour of a sauce because, Tom, you'll know exactly how to add a little bit of this and get the thing really singing and dancing. But that, unfortunately, is for another day because that's all we've got time for. Oh, Rosie wants to say something. I just want to say, to say um, in honour of my mum, who I feel like I've really <laughs> thrown under the bus here, always, well, I know it's hard to save any gravy. That's why I should always make loads of it because it's, it for me, it goes all over everything. Um, but keep a bit of the gravy, freeze it and then add it to the next one. <laughs> because what's better than adding a bit of gravy into the gravy? That is just going to boost the flavour of the gravy. So do try and do that. In honour of Chrissy B. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. And we must carry on eating this chicken. Let's keep going. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food. <laughs>